Hi, welcome everybody. I'm so excited to have Dr. Jen here with me and we're going to talk all about breast health. I know that especially for those of you, most of you that are in your 40s, 50s, 60s, this becomes something that is more common that we're seeing from a lot of our friends, our moms, our aunts, and um, it's concerning and it's something that we want to try to prevent if we haven't had it. And if we have had it, obviously prevent reoccurrence as well. So Dr. Jen is a former breast surgeon, right? And yeah, she, although I, I'll say that you're probably once a breast surgeon, always a breast always, surgeon. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But more on the conventional side of that. And now you have kind of done a little bit of a maybe not quite a 180, but a little bit of a shift into more functional medicine, mm -hmm. functional yeah. oncology. Um, and so I'm super excited to hear kind of what your take is, in, uh, is on it, because I know not all doctors are into the prevention side and really looking um, at how we can live our lives in a different way so that we're not either getting breast cancer or getting a reoccurrence. So if you want to go ahead and start out with what your, how did you end up going from, you know, just doing the breast surgery to really looking at the whole person and what, um, you know, what you're doing now? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's so great to be here with you today. Um, I really never knew a time when I didn't know about breast cancer. I mean, I don't, I don't think that I was born thinking that I was going to change the world of breast cancer, although I know that now. Um, but there wasn't a time in my life where I don't remember knowing about breast cancer because it affected so many of the women in my family uh, in every generation and in every age. So growing up, I had a first cousin. Her name was Linda Creed. She was a singer-songwriter in the 1970s and 1980s. She wrote all the music for the spinners and the stylistics, which you're not old enough to know who they are. But in any event, her most famous song was The Greatest Love of All. Oh. So she wrote that song. That always gets a wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it deserves a wow, right? Yeah. Because it's one of the most famous songs of all time. And she wrote that song in 1977 as the title track to the movie, The Greatest, starring Muhammad Ali, but it really received its acclaim in March of 1986 when Whitney Houston will release that song to the world. Now, at the time, I'm 16 years old and my cousin is literally a rock star and my whole life, my cousin has literally been a rock star. So it's like a really, really, really big deal. And when Whitney releases the song, it spends 14 weeks at the top of the charts. So it's playing all the time. But my cousin doesn't know because despite the fact that she wrote 54 hits and this was just another one of her 54 hits, she died of metastatic breast cancer one month after Whitney released the song. Gosh. So she never got to understand the impact that she would leave on the world. And she certainly never got to understand, although I am a deep believer in, in faith and in um, the Jewish way of thinking, which is that our time on this earth is just a fraction of what our soul experiences. And there's no doubt in my mind that Linda is watching me and watching what I'm doing and how I'm changing the conversation around breast cancer. But her life and her death gave birth to my life's purpose. So without question, she was the reason why I became a doctor because I never wanted another woman, another family, another community to have to suffer the way that mine suffered. And so fast forward, you know, I go from 16 to <laughs> whatever I, I go to, I become a doctor, I become a surgeon, I become the first fellowship trained breast surgeon in Philadelphia. And I did that for a really long time and I did it really well. And I'm about 15 years into my career when I get my own diagnosis and I go from being the doctor to being the patient. 
And though I wasn't diagnosed with breast cancer, I was diagnosed with thyroid. When you're sitting in that room, having your doctor tell you that you need surgery and chemo radiation, it's quite a different experience. And despite the fact that I said these things all day, every day to women, when those words are coming at you, it feels different. And for me, what's good for the goose was not good for the gander. And it was the first time in my career, and at this point I had been a doctor for nearly 20 years, it was the first time in my career where I really considered what all of that means. And it was the first time in my career that I really thought about what we were doing in treating people. And, you know, I, I understood the standard of care. I was running the cancer program from my hospital at this point. So it wasn't just me telling the breast cancer patients to get treated. It was me telling everyone with cancer to get treated. And this, the, this is what we do. And this is how we do things. And I walked out of the office of my physician and friend and colleague. And he said to me, the thing that I said to women all the time, he said, Jen, you're going to die. You're going to die of your disease. And I don't know if it was God. I don't know if it was the universe. I don't know what it was, but something told me, no, that's not true. And there's something else out there. Go find it. Go find it. And that's what I did. I spent years finding it. Now, I was very fortunate, and this is where I really believe that God and universe comes in, in that very, very early on in this quest, I was sitting in a, um, a lecture hall and this man walks on stage and he introduces himself as a functional medicine physician. Now this is 2017 and I had never heard of a functional medicine physician. And so of course my first reaction response to this person was, <laughs> what's this quack talking about? Right. <laughs> because we fear what we don't understand. And so we label it, right? So he was a quack and he speaks for about five minutes and everything he's saying is resonating so deeply with me that in that five minutes, I went from a doubter to, oh my God, this is telescoping the rest of my life. This is not only how I'm going to recapture my health, but this is how I'm going to change the world of breast cancer. Because as a surgeon, yes, of course I was making impact. And there is no greater privilege on earth than being a surgeon. I mean, literally people go to sleep and leave their lives in your hands. It is the ultimate trust, the ultimate trust because they have zero control over what happens. And I have 100% control over what happens. And that was an amazing, awesome time in my life. Wouldn't trade it for anything. But when Mark Hyman got on that stage, he changed my life. And I, I wrote about him in my book because he literally changed my life. And that day that I heard him speak and heard him speak about root cause medicine and heard him speak about the fact that 80% of our chronic disease and breast cancer falls right in there. 80% of our chronic disease is completely preventable if we shut off the faucet of inflammation that we are flooded with. We are flooded with. Mm -hmm. So I enrolled in the Institute for Functional Medicine that day, spent the next three years immersed in the study of functional medicine. And when I did that, I just knew that I couldn't go back to practicing the way that I had been practicing before, because when you remove a breast cancer, you are changing people's timeline in that you're cutting down on their disease burden. So it takes a little more to catch up, but you're not changing the trajectory of their life. You're not changing, you're not taking them from sickness to health. 
you're taking them from sickness to like a little less sick, but a little, a little, not a lot, a little. Yeah. Right. Because unless you change why they got breast cancer, Mm -hmm. what's stopping the cancer from coming back or worse? Because the thing that we often don't think about is that the vast majority of women who get breast cancer and the ones that don't, they don't die of breast cancer. Women are dying of heart disease, right? Women die exponentially more of heart disease in every decade of their life past the age of 30 than they do of breast cancer. But we're not talking that. about it no. because it, no. it doesn't, it doesn't garner the same kind of, um, affection, sympathy, like whatever you want to call it, because the breast is tied to so many things, sexuality, identity, appearance, like you name it, the breast is tied into it. Um, it gets more attention. And I think that there is a large part of our society that wants to believe that breast cancer is bad luck. But breast cancer is not bad luck. Breast cancer, maybe it's a little bit bad genes, a little bit, tiny, tiny little bit. Mostly it's bad environment. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that we can control. But you have to get out of the mindset that the cancer is the problem because the cancer is not the problem. And this is what I learned on that day from Dr. Hyman. The cancer is not the problem. The cancer is the symptom of the problem. And we need to stop focusing on that tumor and focus on why the tumor's there. And so it was when I had that complete realization that I knew that I had to leave surgery because you there is no room in that system that is disease focused to talk about health, but health is the solution. And I think a lot of people think when they get, maybe not a lot, but there are a subset of people who think when they get breast cancer, that they're healthy, that they're already doing the things. Most, most people, most people. And I don't want to take away from them doing the things because a lot of women are doing the things. And there are a lot of the things that we think are good for us that are not so good for us. Um, I'll give a perfect example in that I've had many women over the years who have come to me with their breast cancer diagnosis and say like, I am so healthy, but I have breast cancer. And I say, you know, tell me about, tell me about how you're healthy. Well, I'm a marathon runner. I'm like, oh, well, that's a problem, right? Because we are not meant to be marathon runners at all. It's very unphysiologic. We are designed to be either in one of two states. We're designed to be in safety and we're designed to be in danger, but we're designed to be in safety 95% of the time. And we're designed to be in danger 5% of the time. You either ran away from the tiger in seconds or you died, but no one is meant to be running away from that tiger for hours or days or weeks or months or years. And yet Marathon runners are running away from that tiger for hours every week, week after week, month after month, year after year. Do you so, think? Do you think that? And I see this a lot with women now. This the stress that they're under from jobs and parent aging parents and teenagers and all the things. Do you do you think that part of maybe the increase in breast cancer has to do with our busy lives and our stressors and without question, there is no doubt in my mind that that's what's happening. The, again, like our bodies only understand two states and we cannot differentiate between our cell phone going off, a job deadline, a, a, a relationship that is stressful, or an actual tiger. Like we, we don't, we're, we're not that sophisticated. We only understand that things are, we're in danger or we're safe. And so many people have surrounded themselves by veritable tigers. 
just everything in their life is a threat to their safety. And when you are living in this cortisol dominant state, there's so much dysfunction that goes on because we're not meant to do that. We're not meant to be there. And so all of these people who are in this kind of danger state for hours every day, their immune systems are shut off because why do you need to heal from the common cold if you're going to get eaten by a tiger in a couple of seconds, right? And you don't realize that. Why do you need perfusion to certain organs if you're going to get eaten in a second? So, you know, one of the organs where perfusion is shut off to is the breast Mm -hmm. because the breast is not an essential organ. Even if you're breastfeeding, your breast is not an essential organ because your body is always going to choose safety over reproduction. So if this world isn't safe, it's not safe for your child either. If this world isn't safe, it's not safe to bring a child into the world. So this is a reason why there's infertility. And this is a reason why there's breast dysfunction. Because if you're shutting off the circulation to your breast, yes, you're shutting off the input, but you're also shutting shutting off the output. The output is how the toxins get cleared. And the breast is a home for toxins because we store our toxins in fat cells And the breast, even someone who has dense breast, even someone who has a a preponderance of breast, dense breast tissue is still going to have plenty of fat in that breast. Mm -hmm. It's one of the primary tissues of the breast. So it is a storage basin for toxins. And then if you're in this cortisol dominant state and shutting down circulation to the breast, you're not clearing those toxins out. Mm-hmm. So this is another reason why the breast is the canary in the coal mine. So what would you say are a couple things that people believe that maybe aren't necessarily true about breast cancer? I think one of them we kind of started talking about here, which is that it's kind of just bad luck. It's just yeah. cancer yeah. Just happens to people. There's not a whole lot you can do about it. And we've started the conversation of, and we can get to that in a minute, what you can yeah. do about it. I think that's one major myth is just that cancer just happens and everything causes cancer. And so, yeah, yeah. like kind of you throw your hands up, everything yeah. causes cancer. There's nothing I can do. It's simply not true. Also the, the belief that it's your genetics because it's not your genes. And we know that even in that five to 10 po- a percent of the population of people get who get breast cancer that have a genetic mutation even in that in that tiny percentage there is not 100% penetrance even in those people meaning that 100% of people with a BRCA gene will not get breast cancer and so we know that something else is in play and that something else is the environment And it's the epigenetics, it's our environmental influence on our genes that decides what gets turned on and what gets turned off. And this ends up being the far more meaningful piece. So yes, your genes play a role, but we we have the ability to determine which genes get turned on, which genes get turned off. And that's all by how we control our environment. And the biggest, the biggest influencer, the thing that we don't talk about enough is metabolic health because the biggest driver of breast cancer is insulin. And so many people are walking around with elevated insulin levels and they don't know it. And it's because we're not testing it. And that is the thing that should be tested all the time. We should know what our circulating insulin levels are so that we can know, are we in metabolic health or are we not? Because we all need to be concerned about metabolic health. That needs to be like priority number one. But there are lots of kind of myths around breast cancer. The one that I, I, I think about three. 
the one that I think about the most is estrogen causes breast cancer, right? There's this whole um, very oversimplified explanation because 70% of breast cancers will have estrogen receptors on them. We, we think that that implies causality, but what most people don't know is that we have estrogen receptors everywhere in our body. We have them in our hair follicles. We have them in our skin. We have them in our eyes. We have them in our gut. We have them in our breasts, in our, uh, in our heart, um, in our bones, in our muscles, in our genital urinary tract, like they're everywhere because estrogen is the hormone of life. So to say that estrogen causes breast cancer makes ridiculous assumptions. Like if estrogen caused breast cancer, that would mean that every woman was put on earth for the purposes of developing breast cancer. It's absurd. If estrogen caused breast cancer, why don't we see it at the times when estrogen surges, like teenagers, like pregnancy, where we have 10 times the amount of circulating estrogen, and yet breast cancer in pregnancy is exceedingly rare? Why do we see the preponderance of breast cancer in the postmenopausal population where the amount of estrogen that you can measure in the body is almost zero, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like we get a little bit from our adrenals and a little bit of, um, of aromatization of estrogen from our fat cells, but really most postmenopausal women barely have measurable estrogen and yet we see it exponentially more in postmenopausal women so it's this whole convenient oversimplified explanation for the purposes of selling anti-estrogen drugs i mean that that's why that explanation is there um and so we we have to get rid of we have to unlearn that because it's simply not true. Now, when I say estrogen doesn't cause breast cancer, I'm talking about the stuff that's made by your ovaries. I am not talking about all of the xenoestrogens in our environment because I believe that they do cause breast cancer. They cause breast cancer in their initial forms and they cause breast cancer in the breakdown products as our bodies try to get rid of them. Some of them we can't even get rid of. Some of them are PFAS, they're forever chemicals. So we need to stop talking about estrogen causing breast cancer because it's a ridiculous notion. And we need to start to talk about xenoestrogens and getting rid of those because they are a major problem. So one of the best things that that all of us can do is go through our homes and go through uh, our routines and make sure that we are not using plastic, that we're not drinking out of plastic, that we're not having our our pots and pans coated with um, nonstick surfaces, that we are not using those Keurig machines. I'm sorry, I don't mean to pick on the brand, but I can't think of the other brand, but whatever. You know, not not pouring hot water through a plastic cup every morning and enjoying that as your morning beverage. Um, but the other thing to think about is, well, certainly like what you're washing your clothes with, what you're washing your dishes with, what you're cleaning your home with, fragrance, those kinds of things. Um, but also synthetic birth control pills because they are xenoestrogens. Um, uh, kind of all the things that translate into these xenoestrogens, these synthetic estrogens. Think about antibiotics all the time. And I'm not telling people not to use antibiotics. Of course, I'm not saying that. But that, you know, because if you need antibiotics, you need antibiotics and they have saved countless lives. So if you need them, yes. But do you need them in your toothpaste? Do you need them in your shampoo and your conditioner? Do you need them in your face cream? Because they're there. Mm -hmm. They're there. Yeah. So unless you are consciously looking at the products that you're using, you are dosing yourself every single day with these xenoestrogens. So I remember Felice Gersh, who was on my podcast a little while ago, said, if you're taking synthetic birth control pills, 
you might as well just melt down a credit card of plastic and eat that because it's the same thing, right? So we just need to be mindful of those xenoestrogens coming into our body because they are without question causing disease. And I think so, about our kids, you know, they're even more inundated because absolutely you know, we didn't have all that when we were there. I know the plastic know. water bottles and you know, all that stuff. And now, yeah. And sports drinks and all the, you know, box things that's all lined in plastic and food storage and all of that. I mean, and, and even how you're purchasing your food, you're purchasing your food in plastic, plastic containers and, um, and plastic wrap and all of that. So just being mindful of that, you're not going to eliminate it all. You can't possibly eliminate it all, but we have to remember that we are not living on our grandmother's earth. We're not even living on our mother's earth. And we need to simplify things and get back to the way they did it in as much as we can. So cook as much as you can at home because you have the control over those ingredients and minimize the amount of xenoestrogens that you have coming into your body every single day. So, you know, that's the first thing is that we have to unlearn that estrogen causes breast cancer because it's simply not true, but xenoestrogens are without question a problem. The, the playing on that theme, there's this belief that because breast, uh, because estrogen causes breast cancer, that people with breast cancer can't have hormones and since the Women's Health Initiative was released in 2002 or 2003, decades of women have suffered and they've suffered unnecessarily. First of all, all of that data has been retracted. It was not significant, significantly, st- statistically significant. Sorry, I couldn't get that yeah. word out. Um, and beyond that, uh, we actually have very good data that hormone replacement when given appropriately is actually very protective. It's protective against a whole host of things, but we know what it doesn't do is cause breast cancer. And so not only have the menopausal population been completely discarded and been done a huge disservice to, But then the people who have had breast cancer, and I make a distinction between have and had, because if you have breast cancer, if you're within a year or two from your diagnosis and you're still in the active phase of restoring your health, that is not a time to worry about hormone replacement. However, if you've completed treatment, we we have to look forward to your quality of life and we can't save women from breast cancer and give them a life that's not worth living. And we're doing that. We're doing that more often than we're not. So there are some absolutes for me. For instance, a woman who has been treated for breast cancer in the past and it was a hormone negative breast cancer, there shouldn't even be any conversation these women should be offered hormone replacement. And when I talk about being offered hormone replacement, I am talking about after you have done everything to maximize their health and those um, those pillars of health need to be installed into everyone. Um, but when these women go through menopause, they should be offered biological hormone replacement, just like everyone else, right? So if you had a hormone negative tumor, there shouldn't even be any thought to it. If you had a hormone positive tumor, but you no longer have breast cancer, you no longer have evidence that you have breast cancer, you're metabolically healthy. I can't think of a single reason why you shouldn't be offered BHRT. And in fact, Avram Blooming wrote a position paper about it where he reviewed all of the data in 2022. And even though the studies were small, there's not a single study except for the habit study. And we can talk about the problems with the habit study, but there's not a single study 
that shows that there's an increased risk of death in women who take hormone replacement after breast cancer. And in fact, they, they have benefits over women that don't take hormone replacement because they have healthier hearts and brains and bones, and they have healthier sexuality and they have, um, they, they have more of a desire to live because we're giving them a life worth living. And that goes a long way because I'll tell you the one way to guarantee that you're going to have premature death or uh, a recurrence of cancer is to make women miserable. Yeah. Because if you're in pain, mm -hmm. if you're suffering, if you're losing your relationships, if you're losing your desire both to live and to want to engage with people around you to be a social creature, because that's what we are built to do. If you're losing your bone health, if, any of that, this is going to significantly interfere with your desire to live. And we know that people live as long as they want to live, mm -hmm. right? And when that desire to live goes away, so does life. So what is the reasoning behind the estrogen blockers that they give you then after when you have breast cancer that yeah so if you are actively trying to reduce disease mm -hmm. i think that estrogen blockade is one way mm -hmm. right not everyone is going to respond to it which is why there is such mixed um mixed data on it however when we look at the absolute benefit from those drugs, it's not much. Yeah. It's not much at all. And remember, we tend to see what the, um, what the drug developers want us to see. And the data that doesn't support it is not, is not seen at all. And so I, I think that that data serves a very specific agenda and I'm not saying that I don't use hormone blockade because in an instance where I need to quickly lower someone's disease burden, I will use it in that window. But at the same time, I'm not, I'm not keeping people on these drugs for five and 10 years because I, there's no benefit to doing it. Side effects too. And these women really, really start to suffer. Yeah. So... I believe in using it in the short term and PS, if you're not getting response in the short term, get off of it mm -hmm. because there's no benefit to you. So, um, I look at, I look at it on a very individual basis, but to me, there's not a rationale for keeping women on, on these drugs for five and 10 years. There may be a very select population of women um, that either have metastatic disease and you're, you're, and even in those populations, I'm, I'm only pulsing the drugs. I'm not keeping them on straight through, mm -hmm. um, because it's hard to live on these drugs and you want these people to want to live. Right. Yeah. Um, and getting to getting to their why ends up being far more important because, you know, you can give these drugs all day long. And if you don't eliminate their why, th these cancers are just coming back. Right. You, you can't continue to mop up the floor if your sink is overflowing, yeah. right? You're, you're not, you're not winning that battle. You've got to turn off the faucet and we can talk about the reasons, but you know, for so many women, the answer is in their mouth or it's in their gut or they have mold exposure, it's in their environment, they have chronic Lyme, they have, you know, some kind of chronic infection that is driving this, or their stress response is so turned on that their immune system is turned off. It's not unusual for me to see women walking around with white counts in their twos and threes, wondering why they have breast cancer. Well, listen, all of us make all of us make cancer cells, the young, the old, everyone in between, we make cancer cells. But if you have an intact immune system that's surveying the body, it can say, oh, hey, you're a cancer cell. I'm getting rid of you. Mm -hmm. But if your immune system is distracted because you have a chronic infection in your mouth that you don't know about, or a chronic infection in your gut that you don't know about, or you're eating a diet that's not right for you, or your pancreas is under functioning. And so you're using your white cells to digest your food 
this is a problem Mm -hmm. and it's not going to be available to find that little cancer cell. And once it gets to a certain stage, it's a viable tumor. So we need our immune system to be working, but the way that we're living our lives and the environment in which we're living our lives and the lack of recognition for what is healthy, because health is not the absence of disease, health is optimal function, but no one's helping anyone function optimally. Like, unless we deal with that, we're just going to continue on this breast cancer hamster wheel, Mm -hmm. right? Because we need our immune system. And yet all evidence to the contrary, like we're, we're living lives that don't support healthy immunity. I don't even think most, even after you get a breast cancer diagnosis, I don't even think most people figure out the root cause of why it happened. I mean, I don't think most people are doing the testing or testing their they're, gut. They're, they're not. Blood work, all they're that not. kind of stuff. To try even to asking out. the questions, like a medical yeah. oncologist should be saying, hey, do you have metal amalgams in your mouth? Have you ever had root canals? Have you, Did you have wisdom tooth extraction? Because if you have these chronic cavitations in your mouth, that is just sucking your immune system dry. Mm-hmm. Literally, your immune system is focused on keeping that at bay and it can't. And it can't, something's got to give. And breast cancer is often the result of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not having the conversations that we need to have around the why. And it's not always easy. Sometimes it's obvious, right? Sometimes people say, like, I I lived in a moldy home or I just went through a divorce or, you know, I lost my mother after two or three years of being her caregiver. You know, there are some times when what's pulling you away is obvious. What's draining your health is obvious. And other times it's not so obvious. And these are the times when we really have to be having conversations like this that have to get out there because we want everyone to say, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Because it's not normal to get breast cancer. We have normalized it, Mm -hmm. but it's not normal to get breast cancer. Yeah. That's good to hear though, because I think we have, I have so many friends and we have so many people we know that have it, that you almost feel like it's inevitable. Yeah. Yeah. And a little bit, and this is the cynical side of me, so you'll forgive, but a little bit, you know, the system depends on it. Yeah. Breast cancer is big business, Mm -hmm. big business. And, and so many of the breast cancers that we see are over diagnoses. So the DCISs, you know, the 40,000 DCISs every year are over diagnoses. Um, a good percentage of the invasive breast cancers that we see every year are over diagnoses. And doctors like to feel good about themselves and like they, they saved you. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the system is kind of built for this this kind of performance in that let's find these things and cure them, even though they would have never become clinically relevant and they would have never hurt someone. But in curing people, we really hurt them mm-hmm. because the women that, who undergo treatment for DCIS, they actually have a shortened um, life expectancy. And that's because our treatments affect vital parts of their existence. So if you're going to put someone on hormone blockade after DCIS, then you're going to affect their heart health, affect their brain health, affect their bone health. These are three of the major reasons, heart disease, Alzheimer's, uh, fractures, these are three of the major reasons why women die. Mm -hmm. So we can't trade in a disease that wouldn't have hurt them for one that surely will. Yeah. So this is a major problem, but the system relies on it because right now the only way that the hospitals make money, the only way the doctors make money, and please know that I am not insulting doctors. They are very well-intentioned people who are doing their job right? They, they train for a job and they, and most of them do that job really well, just that the job is wrong. Yeah. The job is wrong. Our system is broken because it only rewards illness. Mm -hmm. It doesn't reward health. There's no way for a doctor to make money if you're healthy. 
There's yeah. no way for a hospital to make money if you're healthy. And the preventative care, and we're going to get to talking about that a little bit, even that is a lot of the preventative care, and I can talk about it in a number of industries, are disease drivers. You know, we can start with fluoride. Yeah. Right? So fluoride is one of the major um, elements of conventional dentistry, and yet it doesn't do anything to prevent tooth decay. And so, and that's how dentists make money, drill and fill. That's how they make money. Uh, and until we figure out a way to compensate people for promoting oral health, it's going to continue. But in the meantime, we have a thyroid epidemic in our country and 25% of women have thyroid disease and fluoride replaces iodide in thyroid hormone. So you may have normal thyroid hormone levels because the lab can't tell the difference between what's fluoridated and what's iodinated, but your body knows the difference. And so you can have normal thyroid hormone levels and feel like shit yeah. and have all of the symptoms of Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism. Um, and yet your labs are normal. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's a major problem with fluoride. You know, we have to remember that anytime we take in and fluoride, the reason that it's in toothpaste and water and things like that is because it was an industrial waste product that they had to figure out something to do with it. And so this is what they figured out how to do with it. And the public is so under informed about this. It's a sin. Yeah. It's a sin. Well, and some of it's just, you don't know any better, you know? Yeah. You yeah. just you go to the dentist and they say you need fluoride or you yeah. need um your wisdom teeth out. Okay, you know. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. We are underinformed. Yeah. Um and or or you need a root canal, right? Or you need a root canal. Those are those are major major problems. So what especially- would you say to people who've already they already have the and I don't think they're doing the metal as much anymore. Are they're they? not. They're doing yeah. composite amalgams now. They're not yeah. doing the metal amalgams, but well, there are still you... plenty of people who are walking around with metal amalgams in their mouth. Uh, and please don't go to your um, conventional dentist and ask them to remove the amalgams because they will, but they won't remove them safely. And you will get a big whopping dose of mercury in your body and it will not make you healthier. I can assure you of that. So, you know, I really encourage biologic dentistry. I think that we all need to embrace biologic dentistry. And the more that we embrace biologic dentistry, the more it will pressure the conventional dental world to up their game. Mm -hmm. Um, Because we need, we need to demand it. We deserve it. We, we, we need better care and we need appropriate care. So I encourage everyone who has had a root canal in the past or has had wisdom tooth extraction, go visit a biologic dentist, have a cone CT of your mouth looking for cavitations, but that needs to be appropriately read. That is a 3D, um, 3D study that you cannot just look at the static images. You have to look at it like it's a movie reel, right? And so you have you have to look at it as it goes through the different areas of the mouth looking for cavitations because if you're just looking at the static images, you're oftentimes going to miss things. So you need it read by someone who is qualified to do that. And then if you have cavitations, you need them taken care of. Mm-hmm. And that often means extractions, um, and it's it's not an inexpensive endeavor, but neither is breast cancer. Yeah. And I would far prefer to deal with it on the front end when I have control over it, and deal with it deal with it on the back end when it when it's controlling me. Yeah. So. Um, but getting back to, I think we we started all of this because I'm a firm believer that if you have recovered from breast cancer, 
you should be considered for hormone therapy. But 100% of women who are postmenopausal, whether you have breast cancer, had breast cancer, doesn't matter, need to be on vaginal estrogen because we have to preserve um, genitourinary health, mm -hmm. sexual health. But it's, I mean, even if it's not about sexual health for you, when you lose your vaginal health, it is, it is very uncomfortable. Um, and it leads to incontinence. People don't sleep through the night because they have uh, urinary urgency. And so now with sleep disruption, now we're talking about any number of disease states because we know that people who are short sleepers who sleep less than six, seven, eight, nine hours a night, uh, these, these people are at risk for every chronic disease. Yeah. And so we, we really need to be thinking about health and longevity for everyone. Not we, we, we need, we need to stop devaluing women because they can no longer have children because we, we still have a lot of worth in this world, um, both personal and in, in a global way. Um, so I am very committed to educating everyone about hormonal health, even after breast cancer. And we have to remain committed to that. And then the third thing that I think about all the time in terms of fallacies that surround breast cancer is the statement that mammograms save lives. And I know that it has very far reaching belief and it is well ingrained in people because you've heard it time and time and time again, but it doesn't make it true and it's not true. Yeah. And for every 2000 women that we screen with mammogram, one woman will maybe receive benefit, maybe, and we will cause 10 women to be treated for breast cancer when they did not need to be treated for breast cancer. And we will materially affect both the length and the quality of her life. This is a problem. The numbers don't add up. We can't cause 10 women to suffer for the benefit of one. And the main reason that this is happening is because we are literally introducing a known carcinogen into the healthy population. So we're using a test that causes cancer to screen for cancer, and we're using it in the healthy population. And I say that to contrast with something like using low-dose CAT scan to screen for lung cancer, because we're not screening for lung cancer in the non-smoking population. We're screening for lung cancer in the population of people that have smoked for a certain period of time. And I can't remember if it is 10 years or 20 years, but it's some major, um, major length of time that it is reasonable to assume that they are at high risk of developing lung cancer. And in that population, because they're at such high risk of lung cancer, we can we can take on some of that some of that risk that we know is associated with CAT scan. But that's not what we're talking about with breast. We are talking about exposing the normal population, the healthy population, without a risk stratification to radiation. So we are causing more breast cancers than lives we're saving, causing them. We are causing these women to have breast cancer. I think this is a huge people, problem. I think most people would say, well, I want to catch it early. So that's why yeah. I'm getting screened. And that would be great if that data were true. But that that is based on the assumption that breast cancer is both linear and predictable in terms of its growth. And it's a lovely, logical theory 
just doesn't happen to be true because breast cancer is what it is from the beginning. So there are some breast cancers that are going to be small And no matter when you catch them, that's a very aggressive process and you're not going to do anything to affect that cancer. And there are some breast cancers that are very large that are not aggressive. And almost no matter what you do, these people do great. But those aggressive cancers, like screening people every year, you're not, you're not going to find those or change those because those are going to be interval cancers anyway. They're going to develop between the time. And, and if you find them early, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So breast cancer, when we look at comparing the populations of those that screen compared to the populations of those that don't, there's absolutely no survival advantage to screening. And that's the thing that matters. Like at the end of the day, none of the rest of the things matter. We want to know, am I going to die of breast cancer or not? And if I'm not going to die, if this test is not going to make a difference in whether or not I die of breast cancer, why am I doing it? So no matter how many women we screen every year, we see the same exact number of women present with aggressive disease, we see, present with advanced disease, right? So screening them every year isn't preventing them from developing advanced disease. And no matter how many women we screen every year, we see the same exact number of women die of breast cancer every year. We are not affecting the bottom line with screening. Are we diagnosing more cancers? Yes. Are we treating more cancers? Yes, but we're not improving survival. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, those cancers are cancers that we're creating. To some extent, those are cancers that we're over-diagnosing that don't need treatment. Um, And and this this is a huge problem because not only are we counting them as having saved them from breast cancer, but we're ignoring the fact that women who are treated for breast cancer are two to three times more likely to die prematurely of heart disease than women who are not. So not only are we saying like, oh, we saved you from breast cancer, but we're also not counting the fact that we gave you heart disease and you died from it, Mm -hmm. right? So the the numbers are really distorted on both ends. So we have to look at the bottom line. And the bottom line is that we can't cause a disease that's worse than the disease that we're allegedly setting out to prevent and cure, right? And that's what we're doing. And we are not affecting the bottom line. Because if we were, then the number of deaths due to breast cancer would go down every year. But they're not. They're not. It's really, it's terrible. As much as we... It seems like we should be yeah. seeing those deaths go down. So would you say what what do you say to people who have dense breasts? Because doesn't everybody in perimenopause have de- dense breasts? Yes. I think you yes, said that's that correct. Before. So we they need to be us- really we need to be really careful when we use those that terminology, right? Because it has different meaning at at different ends of the spectrum. So First of all, when we talk about the tissues of the breast, the breast is comprised of four tissues. So it's the glandular tissue. That's the milk producing tissue. That's the tissue that um, that when we look on a mammogram, that's what we're referring to, right? Mm-hmm. When we say, when we talk about density on a mammogram, we're referring to the amount of glandular tissue that you have in the breast. We also have fat. Um, we have connective tissue that's holding it all together and that's all in a skin envelope. So when we call the, the tissue dense, we're talking about the proportion of glandular tissue as compared to the amount of fat in the breast. Now, a thin woman is going to have mostly glandular tissue because she doesn't have a lot of fat cells in her body and her breasts are going to look like the rest of her body. A woman who is premenopausal is supposed to have dense breast tissue. What are the what is the purpose of breasts? 
it's to feed an a baby it's to it's to allow a baby to become a child and so if you are of childbearing age you should have dense breast tissue and if you don't that's a whole other problem right as we approach menopause as we lose our fertility as we lose the ability to feed a child and our hormone profile changes we start to have atrophy of that breast tissue and it does become less dense and it becomes fatty replaced. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not like you go from having dense breast tissue one day to having a fatty replaced breast the next. It's a process. But a premenopausal with dense breast tissue is normal and we shouldn't call it anything else. That woman is not at increased risk of breast cancer. That woman is normal. Where it becomes meaningful is as these women go through menopause, we should see the breasts become less and less dense every year. And if they don't, we need to be thinking about one of two things. Either they're on hormone replacement, and that is maintaining their, their breast density because it's maintaining glandular tissue, or they're inflamed. They have inflammation. They have a lot of xenoestrogens. They have a lot of stimulation of the breast. That is the person that we need to worry about. That is the person that's at risk for breast cancer. So if you have extremely dense breasts after menopause and they're not changing, they're not becoming less dense and you're not on hormone replacement, this is the person that needs to think, wow, I'm at risk mm -hmm. because here's, here's the demonstration of my inflammation. So I, I'm very careful about when I use that dense breast terminology, because if you are premenopausal, it is normal. It's exactly what you're supposed to have. Um, so, and in that dense breasted population, I would argue that that's the person that mammogram is the least appropriate for. First of all, those people are getting two, three, 10 times more radiation than the non-dense breasted person because it takes more radiation to try to see through that tissue. And if you are inflamed, and if that's the reason why you have dense breasts, you are more susceptible to environmental insults. And so the last thing that person needs is more radiation, right? And we know that in the dense breasted population, mammogram will miss up to 40% of breast cancers. It is not a good test for the dense breasted population. And we're taking a test that doesn't work for them, giving it to them more frequently and exposing them to more radiation. We're doing the wrong thing. And it, this is the healthy population that we're doing it to. They say you should have a mammogram and an MRI. So they want to double yeah. <laughs> up on your yeah. test, on your screen. I mean, you know, look at, look at the population of women who are BRCA mutation carriers. So that's that like five to 10% of, of people who are at increased risk of developing breast, ovarian, you know, a number of cancers. But these are people we're telling them to get mammograms once a year, MRIs once a year, and, and split them, you know, every six months. Well, these women are especially sensitive to radiation because the BRCA gene is a tumor suppressor gene. This is a DNA repair gene. They already are telling us, I struggle with this process. I struggle with DNA repair. I struggle with tumor surveillance. And now we're going to give them a test that causes cancer. Like it doesn't make any sense. So that is a surefire way to get cancer is to expose these women repeatedly to radiation. The other thing is, you know, we're telling them from very young ages to have MRIs with gadolinium. Gadolinium is a heavy metal. It's a huge problem, right? Anytime that you put a heavy metal in your body, it's going to be stored and it's going to be stored at the expense of something that you need. It's all a trade. It's always a trade. 
So I do tell people, listen, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. There, there is a time and a place. If you need to have a mammogram because you feel something in your breast, that's a diagnostic tool. I'm using it, right? If you need to have an MRI because you have an abnormality that needs more investigation, that's a diagnostic tool. I'm using it. But I'm also loading people up with antioxidants before they undergo mammography or CAT scan or PET scan or any kind of x-ray because I want to try to bind up some of those free radicals and prevent the DNA damage that comes along with it. If someone needs a, an MRI with gadolinium, and I'm only talking about with gadolinium because if it's a non-contrast MRI, I'm not nearly as worried. If someone needs an MRI with gadolinium, I'm going to make sure that they're loaded up on zinc before and after that study because if they have adequate levels of zinc, they won't take in that gadolinium. So, you know, there are ways, and again, we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are many, many marvelous things in modern medicine that we need and that are very highly useful for us. However, more is never better, right? And just because we have it doesn't mean that we should use it more. And we need to separate the screening population, the normal population, the healthy population from the diagnostic population, the population of women that have an abnormality, feel a mass, have nipple discharge, have skin changes, have something that is being investigated. That is a totally different story. But x-raying women's breasts year after year after year after year will only lead to the creation of more disease, overdiagnosis, overtreatment, and decreased survival. So I've heard you talk about another tool, the QT imaging. Is that, yeah. can you tell us about that? And is yeah. that is that a more of a diagnostic or is that more of a screening tool? So this is without question a screening tool. Um, and for now, is there a scenario in which you can use it as a diagnostic tool? Yes, absolutely. But understand that what it is meant to be is a screening tool because we do not want to subject the healthy population to a test that could harm them. And this test is 100% safe. So what a QT scan involves is sending sound waves, transmitting circumferential sound waves through a water bath that creates an actual 3D reconstruction of the breast. It is fast, 100% safe, radiation-free, there's no compression, there's no pain, and it has 40 times the resolution of MRI. So this is the reason why it is the first FDA cleared device in 50 years to screen for breast cancer. Everything else was grandfathered in. And the most interesting thing about this technology to me is that it, it's the only functional testing on the market in that if you find something, you can bring someone back for a short interval study, 60 days, and you can recount the cells because it has the capability of counting the cells and generate a, a doubling time. And we know that cancers have a doubling time of less than 100 days. And things that are not cancer or that are not meaningful have a greater doubling time. So is it going to pick up every single cancer? No, because there are some cancers that are very slow growing that will literally never hurt this person. And what we're trying to avoid is over biopsy, over imaging, over biopsy, over diagnosing and over treating. So the, the benefit is that if you have something that has a doubling time of less than 100 days, we tell you, go have a diagnostic workup. That's what you need. You have a lesion that needs attention. But if you have something that has a doubling time of 150, 200, 300 days, we say see you in a year. Let's see what happens. Let's let this thing shake out. Because if you don't need treatment for it, then don't get treatment for it. Because we know that there are serious ramifications of treatment. 
And so this will avoid over biopsy, over diagnosis, and over treatment. And those are really costly things, both to the system, to the individual who has to pay for them, but they're very costly in terms of your emotional health because there's nothing worse than when a woman goes through this whole process of having an abnormal mammogram. Yeah. It's just a horrible, horrible situation. And it ends up taking years off people's lives mm -hmm. because of the worry, because it's just the start of things for many women. Like once you have that first abnormal mammogram, and then, you know, maybe you have additional views, maybe they ask you to come back in six months, maybe they ask you to have a biopsy, then you're on an every six month treadmill. So even if you don't get a diagnosis of breast cancer, once you're on that hamster wheel, it's awful. Mm -hmm. It's awful. And it doesn't leave these women. It's a bell that you can't unring for them. So I want to stop doing that. I want to stop putting people in the abnormal imaging bucket because it's not serving them and it's really hurting them. So where and I, this I believe that QT is, is the imaging of the future because we can, we can image a 20 year old. We can image a, a, a teenager who finds a lump in her breast, right? Where you would never want to subject that, that teenager to radiation. So, you know, it's safe for all ages. It's highly accurate. Um, and it's something that I know is going to permanently change how we image breasts. So there are a couple of places open in the West Coast, and I am working on making sure that everyone who wants a QT scan has the ability to get a QT scan. I can't so wait. That's, you come that's to Chicago I'm... or Detroit or somewhere yep. me so that yep. I can yep. get It's coming. Yeah. Chicago is coming the soonest. Is it? Oh, that yeah. would be great. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. how do we find out about that? Is there? So um, my website, which is perfectionimaging.com, but my perfection is spelled with QT in the middle. Um, that will have both my sites and all the available sites. And you'll see all the coming soon. So you'll know what's coming to an area. And if you want to follow me, there will be a place to sign up so that you can get all the updates. Um, and, and if you follow me on social media, if you follow me on my, my other website, my real health MD website, we'll be announcing everything there. And I also have a podcast that I talk about every week and we'll be announcing there. So I think it's going to be, it, huge. I think it's going to be, yeah. Huge. I mean, if yeah. you can also get doctors to, and and eventually the doctors will come on board. Yeah. Right now, this is going to be a movement that comes from the women. And what we have to remember is 40% of the screening population is not screening. And that's, it's not because of access, because access to mammogram is, is widely, widely there. And screening Plus, mammograms are free, Plus right? Places and yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's not because of access. It's because people know better. And even though they're told that mammograms are safe, they inherently know that smashing your breast between two plates and then radiating it afterwards couldn't possibly be safe. And it's not. And if, you know, if it were just about the pain, women are tough. Like we will do yeah. just about anything if we think it's for the good. Yeah. But we inherently understand that exposing ourselves to radiation, it can't be good. Yeah. You know, they were very smart when they gave it the name mammogram, like they gave it a cute name, right? Picture of the breast. But if they called it what it is, which is a breast x-ray, people would approach it with a lot more trepidation. And before there was QT, you know, I didn't talk about it as much because it made people feel so uncomfortable. But now that QT is there and there is a safe way for everyone and it's going to be you know, massively available within the next few years, I'm perfectly happy calling it for what it is because people need to know. We need to know. And we need to stop causing the very disease that we pretend to care about. And 
I think that if we really want to prevent it, again, we can get into this now, is that it's not just about screening for it. We should be just no. serious. That, just- that's early diagnosis, right? That's not worried. even prevention. I think people get worried when it comes to mammogram. It's like, I got to get it because I'm worried I might have something mm-hmm. and I need to make sure I don't. Yeah. Uh, my hope is that people are just as worried enough to change their lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, when people have these biopsies that I don't even consider them precancerous, but let's like for argument's sake, call them precancerous, whether you have like an at- atypical ductal hyperplasia or lobular hyperplasia, or you get a diagnosis of DCIS, which is an acronym for ductal carcinoma in situ, but it it's just a very bad name because it shouldn't be called carcinoma because it's not cancer. But I don't, in my practice, I don't treat these like cancer because to me, they're opportunities, they're warning signs, they're your red flags that what you're doing isn't working. And let's take this opportunity to figure it out. What is it that you're doing that is telling your breast that it's unsafe? Because cancer is a normal response to an abnormal environment. And it is only in understanding what makes your breast cells feel safe and unsafe that you can actually correct that. So we, you can either see this as a punishment and you know, follow that traditional path, which will only keep you going down the same road you're on, or you can see it as an opportunity, an opportunity to ask your why. What is happening? What is making my breast cells feel unsafe? Why do I have toxic overload in my breast? What is happening in my body that needs realignment? And when we use that opportunity we actually create something way better because we create health. Yeah. So we talked about a few of the things that you, you you know, that might be going on. So one thing is insulin resistance. And we know that that becomes even more prevalent as we age, as we get into, you know, menopause, that becomes an issue. So that's one thing that can not easily, but I would say somewhat easily be worked on. Um, if somebody was going to get their blood work done, would you say A1C is the best thing to test for that? Mm, not really, because I, I, I'm i afraid that that is too far down the line. By the time you bump your A1C, you, you've already had months, if not years of dysfunction. So the things that I'm looking at uh, to ensure that you have metabolic health. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of looking across the spectrum. So I want to know what your CBC looks like because I want to know what your white cell count looks like because I want to know how challenged is your immune system. And then I'm looking at your fasting blood sugar, your fasting insulin, because I want to know, you know, how, how hard is your pancreas working to keep that blood sugar in line? And I'm looking at a C peptide because if even if your fasting insulin is normal, is it normal because it's really normal? Is it normal because it was high before and now your pancreas is not able to keep up with those levels? So I'm looking at the breakdown products of insulin, which is a C peptide. And I am looking at an A1C. I mean, you know, I'm not going to ignore the obvious information, but the A1C is your average glucose over a three month period of time. I want to see what's happening right now. Um, so I'm checking all of those things. And then I'm also looking at the markers of inflammation. Uh, I'm looking at your lipid panel because that's often an indication to me of, is your body trying to put out a fire? LDL, which we have called the bad cholesterol. LDL is not bad. It's the basic a molecule for our hormones um, and for our neurotransmitters. We need cholesterol. It's what makes up our cell walls. Like it's not a bad thing. It's also a very anti-inflammatory marker. So if you're bumping your LDL, that's your body trying to put out a fire. 
So if, if that's what your uh, lipid count is telling me, I'm looking for the fire, right? Like, where is it? And so I'm looking at a lipid panel. I'm also looking at your triglycerides on that lipid panel. That's telling me how your liver is handling the sugar that's coming into your diet. So if your if your triglycerides are high, I know that that metabolic health is not there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm looking at things like C-reactive protein, uh, sed rates, ferritin, markers of systemic inflammation. And if they're there, I want to know where they're coming from. So that's like my basic panel. That's, that's the thing that I'm doing for everyone to say, do you have metabolic health? Do you have immune health? Where is your inflammation? There's another test that I love that has been used incorrectly for breast cancer screening, but I love it for inflammation. And that's to look for breast cancer, but the truth is that it's not a screening test for breast cancer. It's a screening test for inflammation. And if you use it like that, it's very valuable. What was it called? So I, thermography. Oh, so I, yeah. I love, I love thermograms yeah. to look for systemic inflammation. Yeah. That's what it's powered for. So, you know, those are like my basic tools in the toolbox to make sure that people are on the right track. And that's what we should all be doing in a preventative sense, because if those numbers aren't right, then we need to do what needs to be done to get that on track. So we talked about the xenoestrogens is one thing for sure. Cleaning up your household and your products mm -hmm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I'm sure that you would agree that exercise is mandatory strength. hundred percent. Walk. Yep. yep. Um, you yep. said not the marathon of running, of course, but right. Like you don't want to, you don't want to under exercise, but you don't want to over exercise either. Right. Our body is not designed to run away from saber tooth tigers all the time. Um, so I think about exercise. I think about diet a lot and being on a whole food diet. Our body really only understands whole foods. Not every, every whole food is going to be great for everyone. You know, like coconut comes to mind in that if you are from where my family is from in the world, which is like deep in Russia, um, when would I have ever seen a coconut? So, you know, coconuts are not good for me and for people of my lineage, lineage, but there are plenty of people that it is for. So eating in an evolutionary sense, I think is really important. Um, and again, sticking to whole foods because our bodies only know whole foods. They don't understand these processed foods and we're presenting all of these molecules that are strangers to our immune system since 70% of our immune system is housed in the gut. So if your immune system is stuck all the time saying, what the hell is this? It's not going to be able to do the surveillance around your body. So, you know, eating real foods that are good for you, um, sleep, prioritizing sleep, like sleep is where the healing happens. It's where we do all of our repair it's where we do all of our purging because we take a lot in every single day and we got to take the trash out. And so sleep is how and when we take the trash out. And if you're not sleeping and you're you spending a lot of money on detoxification, I'm telling you right now, it's not working. You have to have to have to sleep at night. Um, getting those toxins out, as we talked about, making sure that you minimize the things that you use, that the things that you use, the things that you choose are actually safe and good for you. Um, and then living a connected purpose driven life. Mm -hmm. We are very social beings and we need to be serving some kind of purpose. You don't have to save the world. You don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to do anything other than what you were put on this earth to do. Maybe you're the best mother. Maybe you volunteer at the fire station. I, I don't know what you do, but whatever you do, whatever your purpose is, whatever makes your heart sore and whatever, you know, thing that you're serving, 
that is awesome. And that will reward you with health. Um, but isolation is very, very dangerous and living in a non-purposeful manner is, is not associated with longevity. Uh, and so, you know, are you going to be perfect every day? No, of course not. Can we strive for 80%? I hope so. Uh, and we talked about the stress too. Yeah. Yeah. Having healthy ways to manage stress, not alcohol, not drugs, not things that are going to detract from your health, but having healthy ways to manage the stress. The stress is always going to be there. The stress itself is not meaningful. It's how we manage the stress that matters. Yeah. What do you think about alcohol? That's a cause of cancer. Yeah. So that's like my don't shoot the messenger because, um, according to the American cancer society, there is no safe amount of alcohol for women. If you are actively cancering, um, there is no safe amount of alcohol. If you have recovered from cancer, if everything else is in line and you want to have an occasional alcoholic beverage, no more than one, no consecutive days, you know, I, is it good for you? No. Is it ever going to be good for you? No. Is it going to be the end of the world? Probably not. Um, and so, you know, I think about it in the context of if you're doing everything else right, that probably won't matter. If you are only half ass doing the other things, it probably will matter. Mm-hmm. It is without question a known carcinogen. We know that it causes cancer. It is without question a major driver of breast cancer. And again, if you are actively cancering, it has no role. Yeah. Inflammation too. It causes infl- even more inflammation in a lot of people's yeah. bodies. Yeah. 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 There are any number of mechanisms by which alcohol interferes with your health. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sleep, all that stuff. Yeah. All of it. Oh my gosh. Uh, is there anything else that you can think of? I mean, you know, I do this all day, so I could talk forever, but I think we, I think we covered the high points. Um, I think it's really important to remember that mammograms do not save lives and there is no excuse for putting healthy people in harm's way. So if you take nothing away from this talk today, I want you to remember that you never need another screening mammogram again in your life. Even if you don't go have a QT scan, you never need another screening mammogram again in your life. They do not save lives. People who have been treated for breast cancer can consider hormones after they have recovered because the postmenopausal woman is entitled to good health too. And that is the key to good health in the postmenopausal woman. And estrogen does not cause breast cancer. Those are the hills that I'm dying on. And you're, and you, you are not, I wouldn't say that you're the minority for saying those things. So I, for sure, for sure, say it with conviction and you're not going to, well, you you know, it's not only my conviction, right? This is not my opinion. This is what the data says. And it's just the really loud voices that have said, oh, you're going to kill people because you're telling them not to get mammogram and you're dangerous. Tell me how, show me the data, show me the data that proves that mammogram saves lives because it doesn't exist. It's not there. Show me the data that not getting mammogram is dangerous because it doesn't exist. It's not there. And the same thing with, even though there is not vigorous data on hormone replacement after breast cancer, the data that we have shows it's safe. Yeah. And there's never going to be perfect data. There's never, and if we're going to wait for perfect data, we're going to die waiting right? There's never going to be perfect data, but at some point we need to allow logic to walk in the door. And the logic says that estrogen can't possibly cause breast cancer. Xenoestrogens, you'll get no argument from me, right? Toxins, you'll get no argument from me, 
But estradiol that comes from our ovaries, come on. Yeah. Like we have to be reasonable here. Um, depriving women of hormones after breast cancer when there's no data to support it, it doesn't make any sense. And they're suffering. And we are here in the medical profession to try to prevent human suffering. And then, um, so, you know, my, my platforms that I stand on, I stand on with very firm ground. I may stand alone or in, or in small company, but, um, the bottom line is that everything was impossible until someone did it. And I'm okay in, in standing out there and being the impetus of change because it's necessary and we need it. I, I, I'll, I'll read you one. This is an awesome book. It's, it's, it's a tough read. It's called, um, Mammography Screening, Truth, Lies, and Controversy by Peter Gotts. And uh, he was the lead author on the Cochrane Report that came out and said that mammograms do not save lives. And it's the reason why Switzerland changed their mammographic screening practice. And they no longer routinely screen for breast cancer with mammogram because of it. We owe almost all our knowledge, not to those who have agreed, but to those who have differed. Yeah. And it's okay to be different. Yeah. And I know that that is exactly how I'm going to change the world because I dared to be different. And it's lonely and scary sometimes. And I had to get over everyone liking me because yeah. I make a lot of people mad. But as my husband tells me all the time, if you want everyone to like you, do nothing and say nothing. Yeah. And that's something I'm not willing to do. Yeah. I love that. No, I love that. Cause I think, I think exactly what that book said that anything in the world, like everything that you think of in the world that has made a real difference has come with people who've disagreed yeah. on the way something was being yeah. done. Yeah. Um, but also the um, self exams, that's a great way, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm very much in favor of self breast examination I think that no one is going to know you better than you know yourself. Um, and so if you are examining yourself and something meaningful arises, you're going to know about it. And uh, so I'm, I'm very much in favor of that. I don't think that people should be doing it to the extent that they're driving themselves crazy. You know, once a month is more than enough. And if you're on Instagram and you want to know how to do a breast examination, there's one pinned to the top of my Instagram page. So if you're following me on Instagram, it's Dr. Jen Simmons and my Jen has two N's. And I also am in, you have a Facebook community. I do. Free I, for people to join. Yep. Absolutely. I have a Facebook community called Keeping Abreast with Dr. Jen. And I have a podcast called Keeping Abreast with Dr. Jen that we release a new episode every Monday. So if you like what you hear and you like hearing my voice, you can do it every single week. Um, and, uh, and then there's the Real Health MD community. Um, my book is coming out this week. So that's super hey. exciting. And it's called The Smart Woman's Guide to Breast Cancer. And it's really everything that anyone who is anywhere along the breast cancer spectrum and anywhere along their journey, this is what they need to guide themselves back to health. And it has been a labor of love for the last 18 months of my life. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm really glad that it's getting out there because I know that it's going to help millions of women make sense of this disease in a way that they have not been able to do before. Uh, and I go through all of, um, the kind of gamut of it from my time as a surgeon and understanding the disease from, from that perspective and from a very granular 
you know, this is what we see under the microscope and this is why we call it this and this is what staging means and this is what grading means and all of that. And then taking the bigger picture because we are so much more than our pathology report and stopping that identification with, I ha- I am, you know, hormone positive or I'm hormone negative or HER2 positive. Like you are not your breast cancer. You are so much more than your breast cancer. So putting it in that perspective and understanding how to pave the path to healing. Love that. I downloaded your other one. You have a, a, another mm-hmm. online. I do. I do. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. This is this is the um, big grown up version of that with all yeah. my stories and so much more. And um, and for the people that purchase the book, they get my secret chapter. Um which we will reveal what that secret chapter is very soon, but you're definitely going to want a copy of my secret chapter. (laughs) So super exciting stuff going on. That is very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Jen. This is amazing. I hope everybody goes and follows her on her Instagram, Dr. Jen Simmons, two N's for Jen. Yes. Yes. Uh, and I'll put it. Yes. In. And, and I have a YouTube channel too, under the same name. And so, yeah, you can, you can find all my stuff. And I love your podcast. You have guests Thank on you. and you talk about all, all different, you know, topics relating to I women do. too. I so. do. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time.